Greetings, everyone. Richard Solomon here. This is a co-production of RocketGreenRadio.com and Taking Care of Business. Today, Antonio Sayant and I have a great guest. It's Chris Mormon. And to check out his website, RubiconAg.com. He's actually doing, he's pioneering something that is actually quite amazing. It's called the AgriBox. And welcome to the show, Chris Tell us all about the AgriBox and what you're trying to do, because I think this is one of the coolest ideas. And Antonio was the one when we were talking in pre-production that this is a breakthrough, you know, oh, agriculture absolutely. idea. Well, guys, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so basically we are taking uh, hydroponics and putting that in an upcycled uh, 40-foot refrigerated shipping container. And we really think that this is kind of the uh, the next level of hyperlocal produce. Um, as we all know, you know, California's got some pretty systemic water issues. They're pulling more out of the aquifer every year than they're than is coming down the Colorado River. Um, as well as you know, given some of their labor issues as well, uh, there's a lot of headwinds coming across uh, California produce, and unfortunately, they produce about 52 percent of the nation's produce. It's about a 60 billion dollar a year industry. Um, obviously, hydroponics isn't going to be taking over the avocado market anytime soon, but there's a lot of addressable things that we really think that with our uh, manufacturing automation technology that we've put into the box, we really think we can uh, be a solution on a, on a hyper-local level for, uh, for you know, some of those leafy greens, some of those herbs, and, uh, you know, eventually a few more things. How much, well, this, well. how much does this also tie into the decline of the bee population? Well, actually, we've got uh, we got some buddies who are in the uh, bumblebee rental business. Uh, one thing that I never thought I would actually be able to say with a straight face, but uh, you know, obviously, the the hive collapse issue has become huge, um, and a lot of that's due to monoculture. I mean, we're here in Indiana, where you know I'm surrounded by farmland, but the only two things I see are beans and uh, and corn, um, and you know, obviously, that's uh, that's had some pretty negative impacts on the bee population. At this right. point, we're kind of just hoping to not be uh, a part of that problem. Uh, obviously, in the box, we're not we're not inviting bees in. We might get one occasionally, but uh, we're just hoping to not be part of that problem. So, so I have to go to the beginning. And where was the aha moment when all of this started? You know, when the lightning bolt struck, and you were like, "Hey, <laughs> how, I know, how, 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 how do you even think about something like this?" That's what I want to know. How did you like? gathering information and you go, wow, let me use this, uh, cargo, you know, that, that is usually used in shipping, uh, as the idea to, as a greenhouse. That's, that's where we, where your idea. That's what I want to know. Uh, well, boy, we got, we got ourselves quite a story here. Um, we got an hour. So, so. I, actually, I, <laughs> so. I actually used to be out by you guys in New York. I was a commodity trader for the first part of my career. And uh, trading trading in the oil pits and on the uh, gold and silver pits. So if there's anybody still down on the floor, uh, tell them I said hi. But essentially, oh, by the way, did they do they really kinda, do they really yell like they do on TV? <laughs> yeah. uh, my first my first day in the oil pit was the day after the uh, the guy self immolated in Tunisia, setting off the Arab Spring. You have never seen pandemonium like that. And that was I was a 23 year old. I mean. I almost got my head ripped off, and, uh, well, I did get my head ripped off a couple times. But, uh, yeah, it was as much fun as you could have with your clothes on when things were going well. But, boy, when things went bad, it was not a pretty day. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I had to just see the behind the scenes on that. So continue. So you were a commodities trader, and then what happened after that? So I was a commodities trader, and obviously as a commodities trader, you kind of end up making your money off of the misfortunes of others. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not asking for bombs to be dropped in the Middle East, but as an oil trader, the more oil moves, the more trading I'm going to get to do, the more money I'm going to make. Um, eventually, that kind of wore on my soul, and that and a couple of other things, and I said, you know, this, this life just isn't for me anymore. So I bought a one-way plane ticket to Australia. 
Um, wow. I'd lived with a, I'd lived with an Aussie in uh, in Lower Manhattan in a in a sin bin in Tribeca for a couple of years, and he'd always talk about traveling together. So we ended up traveling around the world together. Um, started out in Australia, kind of moved through Southeast Asia. He kind of uh, went his own way and went to Ibiza for the season because it's a real rough life in, uh, in the islands in Spain. But I ended up in Africa, and I ended up in Africa in Senegal during the middle of the Ebola crisis in 2014. You had to pick them. <laughs> yeah. uh, my mother was not real pleased with my life decisions at that point, <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> wow, but, that's um, crazy. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I kind of went on the walkabout, um, but I ended up in Senegal, and being the the ever-present economist, I kind of saw that, you know, Senegal and Vietnam were basically the same in per capita GDP uh, about five years before I was there. Since then, Vietnam kind of took off as an economic miracle, and Senegal stayed essentially where Senegal always stays. And the difference between that was basically a donkey and a moped. And when you kind of realize after spending that kind of time in the third world, that life really boils down to four fundamental things. You need a place to lay your head, you need clean water, you need food, and you need community. And I figure if we could get in the middle of one of those things, that we could probably do something pretty well. And, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and the boys had the community thing pretty well sorted out, so I figured maybe food was where I'd go. Um, But even in Senegal, where a per capita GDP was about $1,050 a year when I was there, there were shipping oh. containers everywhere. And I said, listen, if there's a place this poor on earth that has shipping containers everywhere, there's got to be a use for this. Well, fast forward about two months, and I was in South Africa uh, having a bottle of wine going from Joburg over to Cape Town, and a guy who walked out of, I swear to God, a Dickens novel, uh, started <laughs> telling me he was building homes out of shipping containers. So it was a 27-hour train ride. We had plenty of time to discuss this uh, at, at length and probably past the length I wanted to. But I kept kind of thinking, you know, there's something about shipping containers. There, there's got to be a use for them, especially because they're kind of the backbone of a global economy. What if you could make the back, that the backbone of a local economy? Um, so I get back, not really sure what I'm going to do. My brother had just gotten out of the Navy where he was a nuclear engineer on a submarine which is essentially one big closed-circuit water system. Uh, I started living with him back in Indianapolis. Our other roommate was an electrical engineer. Eric goes down to the basement, and I'm not going to say on the radio what he wanted to grow, but I told him we couldn't grow that. And he said, whatever, I, I just needed a project. So then the next day, Jesse comes home, and he's got a logic controller that had been running a multi-ton die press making, uh, I don't know, Honda intake manifolds. Right, and right. Oh. he said, hey, I could, I could actually automate this process. I could put a thermocoupler on there. I could, I could automate the dosing and everything else. And it was, uh, it was Memorial Day weekend in Indiana, so I was obviously headed to the Indianapolis 500. And I came back that weekend and said, boys, if I find some money, can we make this a business? And they said yes. Wow. So I, have to, I want to just go back to one thing you said, which is fascinating. Why was there an abundance of shipping containers in a third world country? What? Why would there be so many? Why wouldn't they just be recycled or reused or or something? Uh, that's an excellent question about resource utilization that uh, we might be even past the hour if we wanted to go down that rat hole. But, um, you know, the port of Dakar is basically the major incoming port in West Africa. Because, you know, uh, for the listeners who might not know where Senegal is, it's essentially if you looked at the, uh, if you look at the bulge of Africa pointing back towards the U.S., it's basically nine o'clock. Okay. So that's kind of the first place that any sort of uh, manufactured good from the outside world was going to come in. And I think it was just, you know, goods came in, whether that be uh, charitable donations or, or, you know, manufactured goods for the economy. And I just don't think there was enough uh, manufacturing activity in Senegal just by sending those containers back out. So they essentially just kind of accumulated in the port of the car. And they, they weren't worth enough to just ship back to be reused for some other purpose? Not really. I mean, right now, I can get a container, I can get an un, uh, uninsulated container delivered to our place for a little less than two grand, which that price has actually dropped 25% in the last six months, which does not say anything good about the economy, in my opinion, but what do I know? 
What, but, what, uh, what is the that's lifespan? That's still a lot of money, though. That's still two grand. I, I mean, for something. Yeah, but if you're putting it, if you're putting it empty on a ship, you you know that's it's got to go somewhere. There's a cost of getting it back off. I, right, I don't know. Right. I mean, there's a lot of what they call single run containers coming out of China, where these containers will be built in China and they will have one run from China to the U.S. and then they will never be put back in the global supply chain again. I mean, wow. that's kind of, these are looked at as disposable, which is crazy considering what they really are. Uh, what is the lifespan, supposedly, of a container if it's actually reused? Or what's its potential uh, lifespan? That you'd probably have to ask your friends over in Jersey at Marisk, but, um, you know, I would imagine the average refrigerated container is probably going across oceans, I don't know, 30, 40 times in its, uh, in its lifespan. Right. I mean, I would, I would say it's probably got an effective lifespan of somewhere around 10 years. Wow. So imagine, but, so, well, so it's only used for such a short period of its potential life. Well, let me, let me ask you a question of, uh, about the whole project. Um, how, does, how does this help, number one, how does it help farming? And number two, how, how do you think it contributes to, uh, let's say, defeating climate change, or let's not defeat it, let's say more like uh, help lessen what's happening to to the earth. Uh, how do, how does your project? How how would it help? That's what I want to know. Uh, well, I think we got a couple of different uh, layers of that particular onion. Um, my big thing is, you know, I grew up with grandparents who farmed, or not farm. I mean, I had grandparents who farmed, but my grandparents had a uh, a garden across the road from me, so I was always going over and kind of assisting in that and you know from a young age i kind of had that respect for life just because you know if you cultivate something with your own hands you have a little more respect for life right you also have a little bit better understanding of where your food comes from you know my little cousins who didn't get that same experience you know i would not be surprised if they actually think that lettuce comes shrink wrap in the grocery store they don't they don't know wh- you know they don't know where the origin of their food is i think part of that is kind of fed into the obesity epidemic as well so I think that what we do for farming is, listen, California grows all of this stuff, and they're not going to be able to do it forever. I mean, this is the California water situation is systemically unsustainable. Yeah, people think of water. Nice. People don't think of water uh, in the right way when you're talking about California, because if you're pulling this out of aquifers hundred feet down, that's not water like we consider rain to be water. That's more like water like oil. I mean, it took millions of years to be able to build those aquifers, fill those aquifers, and there's no magic bullet. It's going to rain too much in the next five years, and all these aquifers will be full again. Um, so, I mean, we are really systemically, uh, you know, building a desert where there was a desert before because we're taking all this uh, groundwater out. And when you think about the Colorado River, which is, what, a watershed for seven western states, there is less water coming down that river every year than we are currently pulling out of the aquifers. And That's I'm sure, insane. And I'm sure as populations grow, that puts even greater stresses on everything. Uh, absolutely. So, you know, when you've got that much produce coming out of California, it's not that I'm competing with, you know, the farmer's market down the street. I have no desire to compete with them. We really want to be a part of the solution for saying, listen, what has to be grown outside? And what can be grown alternatively, because we're going to have to grow more and more things alternatively over the next 50 years, because what is it, the next 50 years we're going to have to grow more food than the last 300? Not only because of the number of mouths, but the fact that, you know, we like meat. We, you know, there's, we are feeding food stuff to be get more food stuff. Well, this is going to take a level of efficiency and a level of alternative agriculture that we've never really had to push. I mean, there's always been a frontier. We're out of frontier at this point. So we really think that the fact that we can grow over an acre's worth of food in basically four standard parking spots, that starts to alleviate that pressure. That starts to allow you to say, hey, if we need to plant avocado trees as opposed to acres and acres and acres of lettuce and basil and kale and what have you, then we need to start doing that. We've got to concentrate on the things that have to be grown outside, not just trying to grow everything the same way we always have. We only have two minutes in this segment, but one question I have before the break Will this be something that? <clears throat> pardon me. Will this be something that's important for NASA? Uh, we're actually working with Purdue University. Uh, our good buddy Sam Bergner is actually doing some research for NASA in zero gravity hydroponics. So obviously, 
you know, we've all seen Apollo 13. So if you're in zero gravity, you know, that water, if it's not in a contained vessel, is going to have to go somewhere else. So mm-hmm. he's actually doing it one wicking bucket to, or one wicking container into another wicking container into the roots. And then he's actually researching LED lights. So we've actually been able to learn a lot from his research at Purdue. And, you know, we're all proud boilermakers here. So uh, I'm wearing my Purdue shorts right now, actually. But um, we don't think that we will probably be the impact of NASA as Rubicon Agriculture, but we think that, you know, any motion in hydroponics that is pushing forward, that's going to be part of that solution for alternative growing. And obviously we can't grow it all uh, in soil up there. So, All right. This is Richard Salmon, Antonio Sayant, Rocket Green Radio, taking care of business with Chris Mormon of RubiconAg.com. He's our special guest. We're going to go back and talk more about the AgriBox right after this. Keep it locked in. Welcome back. Richard Solomon taking care of business. Rocket Green Radio co-production. So your hosts are uh, me, Richard Solomon, and Antonio Sayant. And we have a very special guest, Chris Mormon of RubiconAg.com. Uh, who are the inventors of a pioneering hydroponic uh, agricultural method. So, Chris, the AgroBox, explain to me. Now, this is, uh, the the whole idea of it is, is it just based on local farming, or are you going to take this idea and teach it uh, to local schools or nationwide? What are your plans with this? And explain a little bit more about what exactly what it is and how it's going to help the environment, not just farming, but everyone, actually. All right. Well, uh, yeah, so the agro box, like I said, is, uh, you know, it's a 40-foot refrigerated shipping container. So this is something that has probably made, you know, 30 to 40 cross-ocean journeys bringing your food to you. Um, You know, this is where your bananas are coming in. This is where your avocados are coming in. I mean, these are... These really are the backbone of the uh, global food supply chain. Anything that you're shipping, it's not dry and can rot. You know, they're throwing the refrigerated unit on this, and they're kind of bringing it to you. Um, so we're excited to kind of use that as a global piece of uh, the food supply chain and make it more of a hyper-local piece. But essentially what we do at that point is we install the hydroponic systems, but then we go a step further and we put in our proprietary integrated control system. We're really excited about that because we think that, you know, obviously if you're in a field, you're going to have all of the vagaries of the weather. I mean, for 10,000 years of human agriculture, um, you know, the, the weather is what the weather's going to be. You, there's no controlling that. Inside the agro box, you really do kind of have that godlike control um, and allowing you to be able to change almost every variable. So right now we're controlling for 13 total variables, and that can be anything from CO2 in the atmosphere to uh, water temperature, to pH, electrical conductivity, you know, even the spectrum of light that gets to the plants. So to have that kind of control, we think that the more growth cycles we're going to be able to have, the closer we're going to be able to say, hey, here are the absolute perfect conditions for, you know, Nero di Toscano or kale or, uh, you know, Genovese red basil. You know, the more data we're collecting on this, the more we're basically going to be able to have a plug-and-play recipe to be able to say, hey, here it goes. We've got 100 growth cycles worth of data, and this is how it grows best. So we're really excited about that, to be able to um, to bring agriculture to a non-traditional farmer. We actually just shipped our first box to a, a high school in Omaha, Nebraska, and we're really excited about the AgroBox L3. Um, that's kind of an homage to our preschool, but it was the living learning lab. And wow. we really okay. do think that this AgroBox is a living learning lab. Um, you know, it kind of allows students to engage in cross-disciplinary STEAM education. And, you know, I got, I got nothing against the arts, but I think ag fits a little better with STEM education than, uh, than arts sure. do. Sure. So Purdue and I are trying to push that. Um, but, you know, these kids are going to be engaging, uh, you know, physics. You know, what is the workflow of the pump getting the water up to the hydroponic surface? Um, you know, what, what kind of uh, light distribution do you have you know, obviously, you're going to have more concentrated light on the perpendicular than you are on the edge, um, right. you know, just because light degrades over space. We want kids thinking about all of these problems. 
we want, uh, you know, we want kids of varying academic abilities to be able to say, hey, we're all pull, pulling the oar in the same direction. We all have a horse in this race. So, you know, your higher achieving kids are going to be pulling the, uh, the data off of the integrated control system, kind of learning how to manipulate that data in Excel. Maybe your, maybe your kids that struggle a little bit more with the academics are able to do something a little more hands on. You know, what happens if I see Endrot in one of these, uh, heads of lettuce or, you know, why, sure. why is this tomato plant not flowering at the same rate that one next door is? You know, we really want everyone to kind of be able to say, hey, I've got a role in this. And we really think that's kind of the core of sustainability is everyone identifying their role and going forward with it. So we're really excited about that Agribox L3 product. But you know, also that I, I was thinking, like I'm thinking out of the box now, because I know you're, you're thinking of, of the United States of America. But did you ever think, uh, like you were talking about Africa before, and I said, you know, the hunger situation. You know, a lot of people, this is actually a great idea because it would solve a lot of that. Uh, those issues, uh, this idea uh, for people that are starving, like Matt Damon. Um, he, you know, uh, it, it took it took an actor uh, to really think about what was happening when he saw that people were walking miles to get water, and then he said, "But well, why don't we just bring water to them?" Instead of, you know, they're walking like 20, 30 miles with buckets on their heads, you know, and, and you know, and then bringing water back. Uh, how do you do that? So he got involved with water.org, you know, and, and so many other people like Leonardo DiCaprio with climate change and so on and making a difference. So you're a pioneer in this. So, you know, you're, you're thinking local, farming and helping. Do you think this is a uh, like a future good idea for you know people that are, you know hunger that have no foods and the fact that you could grow your own food in these containers? What's your thought? Well, that's kind of something we've uh, you know you learn in business that you've probably got more ideas and you've got the time, money, and talent to be able to run down all at once. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to pick your uh, direction, but that's kind of what we call our BHAG, our big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, you know, solar panels are currently on the same cost curve that, like, LED TVs were in the last 10 years. I mean, oh, you yeah. know, it used to be a 42-inch LED TV was, you know, 2500 bucks. I can go to Walmart right now and get one for 350 and probably mm -hmm. pay less than that. Um, solar panels are kind of on that same curve. So we're kind of keeping an eye on solar right now to kind of figure out when that reaches uh, economic viability. Because as an old Wall Street trader, I believe that sustainability does start with economics. If you got to dump money into something every year, it's not sustainable. Um, so we're kind of we're kind of waiting on that. But yeah, we've actually got plans to have the uh, the AgroBox S2 model, which will be self-sustaining, and we want to be able to do ambient water capture as well as solar power. And actually, we've been talking to some guys. Turns out that all of these batteries in the Teslas and the Chevy Volts, um, you know, you think about your iPhone. You, you know, your iPhone battery declines over, you know, if you've got your phone for two years, it's it's not got the same battery power at the end of two years that it did the day you took it out of the box. Basically, the, uh, the big batteries that are running these Volts and Teslas and other electric cars are the same way. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's the Department of Transportation or who, but... Um, essentially, once those get to 85% of initial battery capacity, those are considered off-spec. Well, right. the problem with those batteries is they are horrifically expensive to try and dispose of. But even at 85% power or even at 85% capacity, you've got an enormous amount of uh, electrical holding power right there. So we think that we could actually stitch those together uh, in, in almost kind of a, an upcycled power wall type concept. Um, so we've actually been talking to some guys who were instrumental in bringing that. You know, Indiana's a big uh, auto manufacturing, uh, I guess it used to be a big auto manufacturing giant. I'm not sure who is anymore. But, uh, but he was with Delco Remy, and he was kind of one of the leads of that project. And we've been working with him on figuring out, you know, what could we do to be a solution for someone who's got to get rid of these batteries, can't put them, put them back in cars, but really doesn't want to have to pay to be able to dispose of these things because they are horrifically dirty to ex or, uh, to get rid of. So, you know, if we could upcycle something else, uh, you know, that, that goes back into our sustainability thesis too. So let me ask you this question. 
compared to dirt and water and real estate farming, you know, you know the, the traditional farm, what are the statistics regarding water and energy and fertilizer, et cetera, usage in the traditional 10,000-year model versus what you're doing? Well, it's always a little bit of a tricky one. Um, I, mean, so I, mean, I meant my... generally, you know, generally, you know, not, not you know, to the, to, to the decimal point, but you must be using far less energy, uh, far less water, and you're getting probably less crop damage and things like that along the way. Yeah, so a few of the uh, a few of the statistics that we like to kind of run with, and these are USDA statistics, is that forty percent of all horticultural crops are spoiled in the United States. Now, there's a variety of reasons for that, but you know, I'm I'm sitting here in Indiana. I mean, you guys are in New York right now, but Antonio might be going back to California tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, you think about the fact that that's two thousand miles. That's supply chain. The average oh, yeah. piece of produce is changing hands seven times between when it comes out of the field and when it gets to my fork here in Indiana. That's crazy. And, I mean, you know, it doesn't take, it doesn't take a very high amount of, uh, of air in any one of those hands to really add up by the end. So we're wasting almost 40% of all horticultural goods. That's insane. The other thing is you got to think about, you know, when I would go over to my grandmother's garden and I'd go pick something out of there, I got to pick that at peak ripeness. You know, I get trained as to, you know, hey, don't pick the tomato too early. Don't pick the cucumber too late. But I get to pick out a peak ripeness. If you're about to ship something for three or four days across the country, you've got to pick that early. So that also lacks in the finishing nutrients. That lacks, uh, you know, we actually think that we're going to be able to have more um, uh, nutritious produce because our supply chain is going to be so much tighter in the traditional SNP, SHIP, and PREY model coming out of California. Um, water-wise, we're using about 10% right now, and we actually think we're going to be able to drop that because we're working on uh, basically recirculating our uh, dehumidifier water out of our HVAC unit back into the system. So at that point, you would have a, a water-efficient system where essentially the only water you would be using would be the actual water um, content of the of the fruit and produce that you're actually producing, um, so we're pretty excited about that. But I mean, even at ten percent, I mean that's, that's a huge water reduction, as well as the fact that you know think about the CO2 offset of not having to truck that two thousand miles. You know, if we get a supply chain of one, two, five, even ten miles from our agro box, that's obviously cutting over fifteen or almost fifteen hundred miles out of where that was coming from naturally. Uh, and the local food movement is growing like by leaps and bounds. But here in Indiana, we've got about a four-month growing season. There's no local food the other eight months. Indiana actually exports six billion dollars worth of agricultural goods every year, but we got one in six Hoosiers suffering from hunger. We don't have a production problem; we got a distribution problem, and, and we really think that being a hyper-local solution is going to be an answer to that. What are the what are the fruits or vegetables that you most or like, you know, for this project? Which are the ones that really just do so well in this? Uh, really, any kind of leafy green um, is the first thing. I mean, I, personally, uh, my girlfriend makes an incredible pesto, and I like getting her a bunch of Genovese <laughs> red basil. Um, Bring it on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, if, old, uh, if old Aneg, the old broker from the gold pit, is listening right now, you know, he used to... He used to talk about some pretty pretty things we're not allowed to say on the radio uh, about Italian <laughs> cooking, but uh, you know, the first time I had twenty pounds of red basil in the back seat of my car, boy, it it definitely smelled like Al Capone and the boys walked in. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> that's so but, true. Uh, that's one of my favorite things. Um, you know, obviously kale is kind of everybody's superfood right now. I, kale's okay. I, I don't want to eat it every day. Um, but, you know, it, it's kind of the interesting things. We're actually growing some pepper plants. I mean, uh, Eric, my brother, he's been growing some black Hungarian peppers, which are incredibly rare. Uh, we're working on peri-peri peppers right now, which is actually something that I brought back from South Africa um, because they would make peri-peri sauce over there. And, oh, my God, it's magic. I mean, you'll never go back to buffalo sauce after you have some peri-peri. So, oh, you know, we kind of like that. growing the interesting things. And we're actually working on a box for the Indianapolis Zoo right now so we're going to be able to grow more interesting uh, exotic or exotic animal fodder. 
because no one thinks about it, but a zoo actually feeds, even half a zoo feeds between fifteen and 17,000 pounds of lettuce a year, and that's obviously an imperfect substitute for what those animals will eat in the wild. We want to facilitate them being able to grow exactly what they want to feed those animals uh, in our box and, you know, not have to ship that halfway around the world. So, uh, yeah, we like growing a little bit of everything. Right now, I like the things that are predictable, but uh, we're working on hops as well because, Obviously, the uh, the craft brew market's booming, and we think we can be part of the solution for that as well. So now, you spoke about Eric, uh, your brother. He's part of the team, right? And who who else? Because there's four of you together, right? How did you meet? How did you all organize and come together? And when when you talk about custom made, you know, design, and you talk about uh, the engineering team, are they part of the 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 company? Uh, that engineer the the uh, agro box. Yeah, so I I do the talking. They do all the actual hard work. Um, okay. I've, I've got the best engineering team in the business. Um, you know, obviously Eric and I. You know, my my mother brought him home at one point, and I had to say yes. Uh, <laughs> but then uh, then Jesse uh, Jesse Robbins is actually our other co CTO, and he's kind of the controls one can. He's the one who basically took that manufacturing automation technology and shrunk it down so we could put it in the box. Um, he's also from Bedford. And, you know, we kind of, the three of us kind of started this thing and then brought Pat in about, I don't know, probably two weeks later. So, I mean, Pat's been with us. Pat Burton is our uh, VP of Environmental Controls. Pat's kind of a hands-on electrical engineer who also grew up installing HVAC with his dad. So okay. Pat's kind of the, uh, he, he's kind of all points uh, he's kind of the, the Johnny do anything and the Johnny do everything. And, uh, and we love Pat too. So, but Eric and Jesse and I came from Bedford and when we were growing up, you know, there was a Ford plant, a GM plant and a carpenter bus plant. We actually made about half of the, uh, the buses in the United States at one point. And now there is half of a GM plant. You know, our Eric and I's mom is a kindergarten teacher and her class went from one third to two thirds free lunch in a year. And we've got one of the worst uh, heroin and meth problems you'll ever see. We actually intended initially to build uh, an industrial scale vertical farm because there was actually an 89,000 square foot building, a beautiful building. You know, the meth ads hadn't gotten in there and ripped out all the copper and everything else that we were going to be able to purchase for $400,000. Wow. So, I mean, you guys are coast guys. So, I mean, you, you, you can't even yeah. get a one bedroom apartment in Manhattan for $400,000. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, crazy. You know, this is 89,000 square feet, and we thought that, you know, this was an excellent mm-hmm. opportunity to be able to uh, kind of bring sure. bring some jobs back to some people who, you know, the, the factories aren't coming back. You know, I, I, Trump and Hillary and everybody else can talk about we're bringing manufacturing jobs back. A lot of those jobs left or a lot of those jobs got automated and mechanized. They ain't coming back. So we've got to be thinking about things in a different way, and we thought, hey, this is a great solution. And Indiana, I think, is the 46th most obese, or, well, we're, we're in the bottom 10% of obesity states. Uh, so, you know, we've got a couple of problems there, and we thought, you know, the more people are kind of interacting with this, the better off they're going to be. Um, obviously, starting a vertical farm is an incredibly expensive proposition, and we hadn't actually grown anything yet. So that's when we said, hey, we're going to do a proof of concept, we're going to automate a shipping container, and we're going to go from there. Well, when we started building the shipping containers, we really enjoyed that, and I saw a lot of markets for it. So the business guy said, hey, can we keep doing this? And they said, yeah, sure. So let me, let me ask a question before we take our next break, which is seeds, biodiversity, and soil depletion mechanics. I assume one of the things that is the end result of what you're doing is you're helping to have more diversity of food in general, especially in places where the same things tend to be done to the soil over and over again, and that kind of causes soil erosion. Um, you don't probably have that because it's all hydroponic. Yeah, we, uh, you know, kind of our solution in that is the fact that less of this ground actually has to be put into cultivation. So obviously the best thing you can do to ground is kind of let it breathe. Um, you know, there's any amount of examples through history of, you know, letting land go fallow. And unfortunately, in uh, 
corporate agriculture, we just don't have the ability to do that. Whether it's, you know, we got a debt payment to make next month or whether that's just, you know, grow, grow, grow. Uh, you know, Earl Butts, Earl Butts is probably one of the great, um, villains of the U.S. agriculture program because he was basically the one that said, plant a fence or a fence or we'll figure out what to do with it. Well, what figure out what to do with it really meant was, hey, we're going to put this in high fructose corn syrup, which our bodies probably don't metabolize all that well. Um, you know, he's he's also a Purdue guy, so we, we're trying to pay that debt back at this point. Um, but yeah, as far as soil depletion, you know, we just want to, we want to be able to uh, grow in alternative spots, uh, and we think that we can do that. So that's, you know, that's that many fewer acres that is going to have to be under cultivation out in the uh, out in the great wide world. All right. This is Richard Solomon, Antonio Sayant, and Chris Mormon, RubiconAg.com. We come back, I want to ask him how he got the name. We'll be right, keep it locked here with Taking Care of Business and Rocket Green Radio. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business, Antonio Sayant, Rocket Green Radio, and our special guest, Chris Mormon from RubiconAg.com. Oh, but before, uh, I know that Antonio has a question, but how, how'd you get the name RubiconAg.com? Uh, well, so yeah, we're Rubicon Agriculture. We just wanted to shorten it down for, uh, for the website. Um, but how'd you get Rubicon? Partners. What's that? Where'd Rubicon come from? Uh, well, Rubicon, I'm a big uh, history nerd, and actually some of my buddies who might hear this out in, uh, out in New York, they can definitely testify, but um, I studied a lot of Roman history, and, you know, I kind of felt like the water situation in California, we really were getting to the Rubicon, you know, the point when Caesar basically right. knew, if I cross this, there's no going back, and I feel like the water situation, that's kind of where we're getting to in California right now, so it kind of had the water connotation, kind of had my, my history nerd that I could... Uh, I could go ahead and placate a little bit. And actually, it is so much tougher to come up with a good name for a company than people would imagine. I mean, we went through, I don't know how many, probably 100 names that we just, you know, sat down here night after night and tried to come up with something and never did. Okay. Antonio, you had a great question? Name. That's actually a great name, and, and you know, it, it, it's catchy. You know, and I, it sounds like the future. <laughs> you know, and... uh the name stuck out, and that's why I, I did a lot of research, and I want to know more. And uh, I know you deal you're dealing with uh, you know teaching uh, the students and and you know uh, getting this into farms. But uh, how about pharmaceuticals? What's what's the idea behind that, and and how would it it benefit them uh, having this agrobox and your idea? for the design? Um, well, yes. Yeah, so actually, I mean, I kind of talked about the fact that I ended up in Senegal during the Ebola crisis. Um, but, you know, if you weren't close to it, people really do forget that they thought the world was going to end in 2014. They thought Ebola was just going to be a, a global pandemic, and, I mean, there's really no worse way to die. Um, the treatment that actually saved the American doctor and the American nurse, who I think were over in West Africa with Doctors Without Borders, which is a phenomenal organization, um, that was actually created by MAP Pharmaceuticals, and they essentially took a piece of the, and I'm, I'm not a biochemist, so I'm probably going to butcher this badly, but essentially they synthesized a protein within a tobacco plant that was basically able to generate an antibody in the, uh, in the human body to fight the Ebola virus. And, you know, that treatment is actually effective. And the FDA essentially fast-tracked it, trying to save this uh, American doctor and nurse after they'd come back contracting the Ebola virus. We think there's going to be more and more plant-manufactured pharmaceuticals going forward. And when I say plant-manufactured pharmaceuticals, it, it kind of is what it sounds like. That is a pharmaceutical that the, the end result is something that was essentially grown by the plant. So it was kind of humans hands off after we've identified what gene or, or what uh, protein we're going to try and get this plant to make. You know, the plant actually manufactured it itself and then it's just processed. Well, you know, it kind of goes back to our education thing. We think we need more kids thinking at a young age about STEAM education. 
Um, and, you know, when I say STEAM, I'm talking ag. Uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, agriculture, and manufacturing, or mathematics, uh, and manufacturing for that matter. But we really want to put kids in a position where even from a young age, they're able to understand, uh, you know, how plants grow. You know, understand that you can right. train a plant, you know, kind of like you can train a dog. You know, you want a tomato plant to do certain things, you can train it around, uh, you know, kind of a geographic space. Um, we think we need more and more kids thinking about that. In the plant manufactured pharmaceutical space, you know, the FDA is, uh, there's, there's some tough customers. Uh, yeah. they, they don't like variability, and obviously with a living organism like a plant, you're going to naturally have that variability. What we want to do is be able to apply the integrated control system to that plant uh, growth process and be able to say, hey, listen, from seed to final cut, I can tell you everything that's actually come in contact with that plant, whether it's the CO2 levels or you know, how much nitrogen was this plant given, how much calcium was this plant given, you know, what was the what was the light structure, you know, wh- what kind of pathogens were in the air. The nice thing about our control system is we can essentially put an analog uh, sensor on for anything that we can then communicate everything into a central hub. So we really think that we could be a great solution for some of that early base science trying to figure out what plants could be the next uh, next manufacturing units for, you know, a common flu or, a, you know, a common sure. cold or anything else. You know, we think that there's going to be more and more research done in this, and we really want to be the solution for the, the scientists tinkering in our lab, being able to say, hey, let's go out to the agro box, let's go ahead and throw a few of these plants in here, and let's see what these plants actually synthesize as far as protein. So we're really excited about that going forward. Um, again, that's kind of one of our, our further down the road goals, but we'd love to talk to anybody in that business uh, who's got a need for research grade space. Well, because, you, uh, you know, know we I, can, could, I, can could, I, could, I could probably try to help with that. Um, just so you know, my background uh, before the entertainers, I was an energy consultant. Uh, my three clients were my Squid, Hoffman Roach, and Johnson and Johnson. Those were my clients, <laughs> you know. It's huge pharmaceuticals, yeah, and uh, they are number one when it came to you know obviously saving energy and and they and they you know did all these projects uh, when it came to HVAC system, energy management system, uh, you know lighting, and they might be interested. I mean, obviously, uh, it is a great idea, and why why not? And if it's part of uh, helping out and will help them and help the world. I, I think they most likely uh, would be interested. So I could try to, uh, if, you know, connect you with certain people there and send you a couple of emails. And I think it's all good. Well, it's, it's and, excellent. And that would be fantastic. We always love making new friends. And I mean, you know, well, I'm in Indianapolis, so we're kind of Eli Lilly guys, but you know, I, I think they'll understand. So, and yeah. one of our early shows with, was with Amy Greason, who is a, medicine hunter uh and maybe she would be a perfect person to talk to because she finds plants that are in remote parts of the world that have you know medicinal properties we had to do a great show on that that was one of our first yep. shows and yep. i wonder if you need to meet amy and amy needs to meet you to grow some of the plants that she's discovering uh so that could be maybe a little bit more you know, because it, it's hard to recreate the rainforest in, you know, in a non-controlled environment. And some of the stuff that she's finding is in, you know, very, very remote places. And this this could actually be, this could be a very, very nice connection uh, between different guests on our show. And, sure. and, and and Antonio knows you both very well, so he can make that introduction in a flash. Uh, right. That would be fantastic. We love growing new and interesting things. Um you know, my my engineers get a little tired of lettuce sometimes. They get a little tired even of the kale. But uh, you know, we would love to be growing some exotic plants, uh, especially if we feel like there's uh, there's some healing capabilities there. Well, yeah, because what Amy does for a living is she goes to remote places and finds the the medicine men, you know, the shamans, and finds out what they use locally to treat all kinds of disease. And then, because she's a pharmacist by trade. And and, mm-hmm. and and she's sort of a naturist as well because she goes into all of these, you know, remote biospheres and, and finds the plants that really are, are medicinal, you know, based. And if we were to take her knowledge and your technology and put them together, that might be a way to sort of produce, you know, here what is needed and grown somewhere very, very far away. 
I know. Be fantastic. <laughs> We'd love. Yeah. You know, and it's you know she she just came back from the Congo, and uh, just just to give you a short story, she was arrested a few times because she had drones, and they didn't know what the hell that was in the air, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it, you know it it. it it got a little scary there, you know, but she goes to places that you and I, you know, would not go. And it's very dangerous if you don't have a guide and, and cause they don't know what a camera is. They don't know the equipment that we carry and it may be threatening to them. And, you know, cause they don't, they don't live with cell phones and TVs and the, the kind of world that we live in. It's, it's a tribe yeah. and we, they have their own culture. Right. Which is why they also have botanicals, that are still, you know, rare and unique, and right. uh, you know, right. and, and and possibly it's, it's the amazing cure. Amazing what kind of biodiversity you get when you're not spraying herbicides all over everything. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well, very, very interesting indeed. We'll we'll and, give you the link to that show, but but I think Antonio could put you guys together. I think that could be a very exciting sure. byproduct of the radio experience here. Sure. Chris, it's uh, what what. You gentlemen are doing, it's just completely amazing to me. And Austin, you know, Castle from Red Giant Union, who brought me, uh, made me aware of you, uh, it, it, I had to have you on the show because the whole point of Rocket Green uh, Radio is to bring people like you so the world uh, learns uh, what's happening around, uh, you know, our community, and hoping that people learn and spread it worldwide and that's just you know because i try to think not just about the united states of america i try to think globally you know how, how can this help the world because even if we did our thing it doesn't help with climate change because it has to be a global effort unity amongst all nations you know and i i think that's why you have people like Milo DiCaprio, and robert redford that go around the world uh preaching uh, doing films, documentaries, uh, and spreading it around because it's something that has to be addressed. And it has to be addressed not tomorrow. It has to be addressed now and today. So your idea is very interesting. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I wish you a lot of luck with it. And it's not luck because I think it's uh, already taken off. And I think you, you gentlemen are going to do great in this, in the, in this idea. And it's fantastic. Hey Chris, what what's the difference between the agrobox and a greenhouse? Well, so a greenhouse is going to be uh, taking in some of that uh, natural sunlight and then trying to supplement it, or kind of just dealing with the fact that you've you know obviously in the winter time you're getting less sunlight than you would be in the summertime, um, as well as a lower quality of light. Whereas we are totally artificially uh, lit. Um, you know, using LEDs, kind of the, the, the leaps and bounds we've made in LED technology over the past 10 years kind of make us possible um, without, you know, having to use kind of, you know, the cannabis guy has been using the big high-pressure sodiums for years, and those, uh, those suckers are hot. Um, there's a lot of heat. So, I mean, what we do is not, it would not be possible if it were not uh, for LEDs. But, yeah, we've, we've really got absolute control 100% of the time. Whereas greenhouses still do have some of that variability, given the fact that they're trying to use natural light. What What is the next technological hurdle that you guys want to get over that can get you to the next step that you're not at yet? I mean, I, we always need better lights. Um, so if anybody out there is listening and thinks they've got a great LED grow light, um, you know, we are always looking because we know there's a better solution out there. Um, right now it's kind of a, a balancing of cost and capability. Um, I would say the next thing past that is, you know, we, we, we're kind of starting out in the box business, but we really do want to end up being the, um, kind of the integration solution for some of these vertical farms. So I, I actually went over last summer and visited, um, oh, uh, shoot, what's the, uh, what's the big vertical farm over there in Newark, uh, New Jersey? Um, Aero Farms. Uh, um, yeah, got the opportunity to go over and visit with some of the developers of that project. Um, actually, Cory Booker hooked me up on that. So thank you, Senator Booker, if you're listening. But, uh, um, no, well, he went to my high school. Okay. <laughs> 
I, I got to throw I hope, that in. I yet. hope nobody was shoving anybody into a locker. <laughs> <laughs> no, he actually, uh, my brother graduated in 1980, and they were like the worst team in 20. They lost 26 to the second of the game. They won the last game. But Corey Booker's team uh, in 1985 became state champion. <laughs> so he was on that team. So, oh, wow. Yeah, crazy story, but very true. Uh, <laughs> so, see, and, and it works. Uh, look, look at his whole political career. and It's just absolutely a uh, great individual, and, and he's going to go far. So you picked the right gentleman to say hello to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, we're uh, you know we're we're obviously excited. I mean, that's that's a great project. But kind of one of the problems that is causing the vertical farming industry to uh, to not take off like I would have expected it to is kind of that lack of expertise. It's who do you call if you want to put money in play in a vertical farm? Because there's really, especially in the states, there's just not that architectural expertise. There's not that growing expertise. No one really knows what a vertical farm needs to look like, so we're kind of shooting in the dark. With our integrated control system, you know, we essentially took something out of a factory. We want to be able to put it back into a factory, and we want to be able to take the data that we're generating in the agro box and say, hey, we know the factors that matter in growing. Let us help you build this facility. So that's kind of, that's kind of the next layer of what we're doing. So I would say that, you know, as we continue to collect that data, um, that's the next big thing that, that I'm looking for as a, as a CEO of Rubicon Agriculture right now. Have you, do you remember, do you remember the name of, of the, in the work was, do you remember the name of the, uh, of the facility? Was it, uh, uh, yeah, it's called Aero Farms. It's, Aero uh, Farms. it's the okay. massive one they just built. Uh, I think it was about a $35 million. Well, it was supposed to be a $35 million project. I don't know how much it ended up costing. Sure. But, um, yeah, they actually put that in an old steel factory over in Newark, as I remember. Oh, okay. Cool. How, how, I, I did not know that. How, how high can you stack your units and still be efficient? Uh, I mean, still be efficient, really. The, the, the efficiency wouldn't really change for us depending on how high. I mean, I think that these containers are rated to stack five high. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it, at that point, it just kind of becomes an issue of how am I getting produce from, uh, you know, 40 feet in the air down to the ground. Um, you know, if, if somebody wanted to stack a bunch of these up, I mean, that's, that's not that big of a problem. They make, they make lists for about everything. Uh, how many, how many have you had? What is the, the greatest number you've done so far in terms of, so, you know, we're, up? we're only a year old. So, uh, we, we've only got one in three different locations right now. Um, you know, two of those school units, one of those are R and D unit here at the barn. Um, so we have not stacked them yet. Uh, I mean, we know we can, these are, these boxes were literally made to be stacked. We just haven't, uh, haven't had the application yet. All right. In the last minute, uh, any, any fundraising issues or anything that you want to bring to the surface because you only have like one minute. Hey, you know, as a, as a startup, uh, we're always looking for money. We're, but more than that, we, we've kind of gotten the money piece figured out. We're looking for strategic partners who also want to invest. Um, so, you know, anybody with expertise or anybody who really thinks they can help us open up a sales channel, whether that's in schools, plant manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, what have you, um, we'd love to talk to you. So, yeah, please uh, reach out. Um, cmormon at rubiconag.com. That's M-O-O-R-M-A-N. Um, but yeah, we're, we're always looking to make new friends. Uh, it's a great industry. We feel like there's a lot of opportunity and, uh, you know, unfortunately the, the incumbent is without water. And, uh, as any history buff will tell you, if your opponent's without water, you don't need to attack. You just need to wait. So All right. we're, uh, we're kind of working on that right now. All right. So with that, uh, Antonio and I would like to say thank you for being a part of the show. This is Richard yeah, Solomon with Antonio Sayant. That was Chris Mormon of RubiconAg.com. We'll be back next week. Thanks for listening and keep it locked here uh, from week to week. We'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.